Hi there. Hello. <laughs> oh goodness. It is so nice to see you. It is so nice to see you, especially because the last time that we were doing this was for your amazing book. So it I feels know. Like a good bookend. Okay. okay, wait, I gotta do a proper introduction now. All right. Okay. So uh for those tuning in, I am V. E. Schwab, author of many books, but most recently The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue. I had the incomparable pleasure of being in conversation with Taylor Jenkins Reed during my book tour in the earlier stage of the pandemic, which I almost call the apocalypse because that's always what I call it in shorthand. <laughs> um, and now I get to interview you for Mallory Rising and it just feels like this incredible full circle moment. It does. And it feels like, oh, there's progress. Like things were, things are like opening up now, but it's we're, a good- Yeah, yeah. You live in a better version of the world than I did when we did this several months <laughs> right. ago. Now, we were discussing before this all started the kind of bemoaning the state of the bio because I yes. was told I needed to formally in formally introduce you. And so, of course, I started turning through the internet to find your introductions and to find your bios. And it is horrendously brief and very <laughs> humble everywhere I look. And so I asked you... Um, what can I say? What can I say that hasn't been said? Because obviously to formally introduce you, um, formally, why don't you saying formally? It is one well, in the morning here and I should close together. Okay. Those formally, yes. formally blame the French time zone. Um, Taylor Jenkins Reid, the best-selling author of seven novels, including the seven husbands of Evelyn Hugo, which is how I discovered <laughs> you, it's the Daisy Jones and the six. And most recently, the incredible Malibu Rising, which I spent all day reading outside in the rain, underneath and like underneath a patio umbrella, just like in the most, it was just like the most delightful reading environment possible. I love it. And if you were not an author, you yes. would be an interior decorator. Yes. Yeah. An interior yeah. designer, which yeah. I feel like that's a scoop. You heard it here. You haven't heard it anywhere else. So um, there you go. So there have been a ton of questions submitted for this, and I want to make sure that we give time to get to them. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to ask you a few questions of my own because I'm selfish like that. Let's do it. All right. So um, writers hate the question, where do you get your ideas? It's just like yeah. one of the worst questions ever. So I like to phrase it a little differently because I do have a deep curiosity as a, as a creative person of like, if you think of a book as a meal, you start out with certain ingredients. Mm -hmm. There are certain things that you collect that come together to help you realize, oh, I have a meal here that I can prepare. So when you were starting out with Malibu Rising, what were the initial ingredients that you collected? I love that you're putting it this way. It's so much easier to answer and feels like so much more true to how an idea gets started. And so now I'm gonna steal that and ask other people that. Do it. Um, so here here were the ingredients. It was, it was Malibu and the beach. Um, yeah. It was a family and specifically um, I'm really interested in untraditional family structures. What are families that are just as much families as any other family that, you know, is not necessarily a mom and dad and two kids and a dog, you know, like, no. um, and so I really wanted to explore sibling bonds and, and what happens when kids have to raise themselves. And then I had this idea for writing about a really wild Hollywood party. I felt like it would be really fun from a creative standpoint to make up a bunch of fake famous people and put them all at a party and then have them wreak havoc. And so uh, it was once I started to piece those elements together that the book took shape. And there was actually one particular moment that my husband helped me with um, when I was like, I feel like I want to write about siblings and they all have different talents, but they get along and they're throwing this party, but what do they do? Like what, who are they? Um, and I, I remember talking about being like, what's great about writing about rock stars, which I did with Daisy Jones is like, everybody wants to be a rock star on some level, right? You get to, to pretend when you write the book or pretend when you read the book that you're a part of that world. What's a world that I want to pretend that I'm a part of or that other people would want to? And my husband was just like thinking, and it was really like a, um, it, it was a rhetorical question, mm -hmm. <laughs> but he was like, 
surfers. And it took me a second. I was like, oh my gosh, yes, surfers. Cause I am the farthest thing from a surfer. And so it was like this <laughs> delicious uh, wish fulfillment for me. So once the surfing piece came together, I was like, that's it. It's a family of surfers. They're in Malibu on the beach and they're throwing a wild party. Now you did manage to incorporate rock stars, of course, because oh, I have- always incorporate a little bit of <laughs> A just, bit a bit, just a little bit, just a little bit of like uh, the, is it pronounced McReva or McRiva? Yeah. Yeah. McReva. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. I just loved that cameo, that crossover, but also there is a sense in all of your work, but especially in this one um, of this like line between the internal and the external life, like fame yeah. and almost like what I would call like big life, small life. Yeah. Because I feel like the main driving force for your characters is very small in that it's like grounded and very human, but there is always this intersectionality with fame. Yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm really interested in the uh, relationship between what something looks like on the outside versus what it feels like on the inside. And yeah. I think fame is a really easy way to tap into that because there's such a necessary artifice when it comes to fame, you have to sell, even even the most sincere, famous person mm-hmm. has to cultivate an image of who they are. We, as an audience, don't like things or don't understand things that can't fit in some sort of box. And so you have to present yourself as one particular thing. And then mo- certainly my characters are always bumping up against the edges of of that box. And so um, I really like writing about that. And and it's for two reasons. One, it just automatically there's conflict and it's internal conflicts. It's a conflict of identity. Who am I versus who do people think I am? But also because I think with Instagram, like we're all doing that every day. Like I, I, it it is famous people, but it's also us like all the time. We're curating a certain story, right? And it's not necessarily the the actual story of our lives. And so those things are in conflict for, for everyone now. Yeah. That person versus persona is definitely something that I feel like whether you're a public person, like whether you have a public facing profession, which authors do to some degree, actors do to a huge degree, musicians do to a huge degree, um, or just a normal person who is curating your online person. I do feel like in 2021, especially it seems more and more each year, like there is definitely a disconnect between who we present as and who we are. And also there's a sense of the more public you become, the more out of your own control that identity is. It's it's about like how other people perceive you to be. And how how other people perceive you to be actually doesn't have to have any relationship to who you are. Mm-hmm. And that loss of control is something that I'm really, when, when you see someone navigate that um, and feel comfortable in the public eye, I'm always fascinated by it because the minute that your photo is everywhere, like you, you lose some control over yourself, you know, um, which, which I just find sort of endlessly fascinating. Well, okay. My brain is branching in two different directions. And I'm trying to figure out how to keep one question in my head while asking the other one. But um, I mean, I do think there's an interesting aspect here as well that like the, the people at the center of these novels are women. And yeah. I do think that there's an added layer. I mean, one of the reasons I wrote Abby LaRue is because I wanted to look at Faustian bargains from a female perspective yeah. and what happens to like the narrative and how it's controlled. And I feel like, you know, looking at Daisy Jones, looking at Evelyn Hugo, looking at Nina Riva, like mm-hmm. there is a sense of trying to take back your own narrative or handle that curatorial element when the public has a large hand in doing it for you and has their own. I'll, I mean, like I got like, such a squicky feeling at the beginning of Malibu Rising where like she's basically being handled in the, in the seafood place by like a father Mm -hmm. who just like is repeating a a t-shirt slogan to her while he like touches her without permission. And I just was like, Oh, like a full body squeamishness. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think part of what's really fun for me in writing these women is that uh, we we do a lot of engaging with female celebrities from the point of view of of judging them, like, yeah. and, and I don't even necessarily mean judging them in a bad way, but there are a lot 
of female celebrities who we have a lot of opinions about, even though we don't know them. And, and I say we, because I'm number one. Like, oh, yeah. I am like, I mean, I, I read the gossip columns almost every day. And so what I find interesting is that we don't offer a lot of space in our culture for their full humanity. They're mm -hmm. not allowed to not like our attention. They're not allowed to do things that we wouldn't do. Mm -hmm. um, we get very mad at women for not fitting in the box. Whereas I think with someone like Mick Riva, oh yeah, we if he doesn't fit into the box, we just keep making the box bigger. We just mm -hmm. keep, you know, or or well, yes, he did this one thing, but it doesn't really count. You know, it's like the the thing people just women don't get away with the things that no. men get away with. And we're not really that interested in seeing the full potentially unlikable aspects of the women that we put on a pedestal and then admire. The, the yeah. minute that those start coming out, it's a very like, oh, she doesn't realize, you know, she she shouldn't complain or why oh, yeah, like we should just be grateful for anything we do get like without being able to have any control over the narrative and that's why it's so interesting to put nina against her father mick because throughout the book you see these kind of headlines about mick woven in and they're always positive despite the fact he's on his yeah. like sixth wife yeah. like they're always he's positive. The worst. and yeah. then you have nina who because she's a model ha seems to like the public seems to have believed that she has willingly sacrificed her physical autonomy by nature. Oh, yeah. Well, well, I, I think we do it. We do it with so many different groups of people, basically everyone that's not a white man, anyone that's not a straight white man, more so. But you see it with the way that um, people interact or, or the headlines about women, the headlines about um, black men. It's like yeah. you've succeeded. So you should be appreciative and not ask for anything else and never complain about the complexities of this. But what's interesting is that uh, we will listen when when men do it, but also we just don't give them as hard of a time. Like, oh, no, not they, at all. They, they just there are so many male celebrities, particularly white male celebrities who walk through the world and just oh, that's just the way he is. And no one's questioning it. And and it's like, we will, and, and I, I say this as someone who has to constantly remind myself to not be part of that because it's in our heads. But like, we will make any excuse for a man who we think is handsome and talented and of right, oh, yeah. any excuse we need to in order to have him keep working and keep making movies or songs. Yeah. I mean, it's like, there's definitely like fame and beauty elevate both sides or, or all genders to a specific level, but then men are always going to get higher than that. Right. The, the forgiveness. Yeah. I mean, I just think about like this past year and like Britney Spears and like the recontextualizing as somebody who was around during the great shaming and like the great yes. breakdown and saw all of the spin. And then you come back. It's just, I mean, hindsight, hindsight is a thing. Yeah. Um, so I mean, the other thing I wanted to ask you before I forget, yeah. before I move on is I, I did, was able to find, maybe it's incorrect because it was on like Wikipedia. So before being an author, mm -hmm. you did work in produ production, right? Yeah. So I yeah. wanted to know if your past life in Hollywood helps yeah. inform a lot of these things that you're exploring and the idea of fame and personahood. Absolutely. When, when I, I, I knew my whole life that I wanted to move to Los Angeles and, work in Hollywood. That was like, I remember being like ridiculously young, like, like I was nine years old and, and it's like, what are you going to do when you grow up? And like, nobody's expecting me to know. And I'm like, I'm going to Hollywood. Yeah. I don't know what's happening, but I'm going to Hollywood. Um, and so I moved out here after college. I got a job in casting. It worked on like some really, really fun movies. Uh -huh. I met a ton of famous people. It was like everything that I wanted. It was super fun. But, but I just sort of had this thought of like, it's not exactly right. I'm I'm close to what I want to do, but I'm not quite there. And I, it took me a little while to figure it out. But what's funny is, you know, I worked in Hollywood and, and at this point have worked in Hollywood on and off for, I mean, 15 years. Yeah. Um, and when I sat down to write The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo, I did like a little bit of research about old Hollywood and like star specific movie stars and things like that. But then when it came time to write the book, I 
I didn't find it that difficult. Yeah. And then afterwards when I was being interviewed and they were like, how did you capture Hollywood? And I was like, geez, I don't know. I just, I don't know. I just did. And then I took a minute and I was like, I have a film degree I worked <laughs> in Hollywood for yeah. a really long time, but it's just things you're absorbing naturally. It wasn't until I started with Daisy Jones where I was like, Oh, I have no, I, I've actually never worked in music. I have no idea what I'm talking about. And now I have to learn how to actually research. Yeah. Other. It wasn't an osmosis style education. Right. No, it was, it was me sitting down first day, staring at a blank page and going, Oh my God, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> and I had to start, you know, from scratch. I love that. I will say that like um, I was part of a casting situation for the first time with an upcoming project that I have. And as someone who hasn't worked in Hollywood, that more than anything else in these processes so far made me realize like the dehumanization of like, oh, the yeah. people for whom their physicality is their yes. is their yeah. career. Mm -hmm. I felt so bad for every single person we watched because I was just like, wow, this is officially the most brutal profession and no wonder the people who succeed are sometimes sociopaths oh, because well, like, how yeah. else would you get through it if you i mean this is this is part of the thing is like if you're going to be able to take that much rejection you have to have something in your brain that is able to weather that and that's why I find really successful actors who are able to navigate this world of being in the public eye and being consumed the way that they are and, and not take it on as representative of who they are. I, I truly don't know how they do it. Like I look at somebody like Meryl Streep and it's like, you seem so healthy. And I don't yeah. know how that's possible. I, like, I kind of marvel at those people. I think it's, I think it's much more uh, frequent that you meet the kind of people that you meet in your books, which is right. people yes. that are being slowly eroded or worn down or, yeah. you know, even somebody like Brandon um, in the books, I'm like not offering a lot of context for anything. Cause that's why it's not spoilery, but someone like right. Brandon, I feel like who believes they are a good person. <laughs> Yes. And like wants to be a good person. And even like early on in mixed life, like believing and like wanting to be yeah. is not the same thing as being under trial, like being under the tests. Yes. I, I in general, I think um, somebody like Brandon or, or somebody like Mick is is filed under like beware the the white man who's convinced of his goodness. Like yeah. <laughs> they are in so many ways the worst ones. Um, if you just can't see your own culpability or the things that you do that are wrong, then you will never understand, you know, how you're hurting people. Brandon yeah. is a big, uh, oh, Brandon, cool. yeah, yeah. I, I loved writing him because I was like, this is exactly the sort of guy who's like, who thinks he's really sensitive and really kind and, and his emotions are the most important ones in the room at any given time. And then he just does thing after thing where it's like, you are a jerk. But at the same time, I'm reading it and I see it. And yet I know that I do this in society with like men behaving badly. At That's what we do. That's like, what we've been trained to do. Give them a thousand chances. Like even if there's one thing that they've done that seems really bad, like maybe we misunderstood, you know? <laughs> Whereas like if there's one thing that a woman does that might have been bad, it's like oh. it's her obligation to prove to us that she didn't do it or she's not like that. Men, men, it's a certain type of man, and especially if they're particularly good looking in a very specific way, we will just, we will just lay down and let them walk all over us. Yeah. And you do something that really, really, I mean, you do a lot of many interesting things. I always, I hate myself for how I phrase questions sometimes, <laughs> but something that I love and something that I want to ask you about is uh, the intersection of real historical figures and fictional historical figures. Cause yeah. like, this was a thing that I had to face in Addy of like when to use real people and when to. But you did it so well. I feel well, like but I asked I you the like same I, question. I feel like yeah. I learned from you, which is like you create fictional characters and fold them in so seamlessly that I am tempted to Google every single one of them <laughs> to make sure that they're not real when they're not. And there's a really elegant, almost what allows you to play in a fictional sandbox and make it act like a historical sandbox, right? Like it's yeah. very clever. 
Yeah. Well, really, and I'll tell you what the trick is. And I feel like I was talking to Jasmine Guillory last week and I told her this trick too, but it's, it's really about like, you have to try to make somebody who seems real, like you, you know, you have to do that work, but then just put them in a sentence with other people who are real. And suddenly it's like, if, if you're like, oh, Nina Riva and Goldie Hawn were spotted at whatever. It's like, well, you know, Goldie Hawn is real. So now it seems like Nina Riva's real. Exactly. I, I feel like, um, I just have so much fun doing it. Like, it's just, it's one of the most unforeseen and just like delicious parts of my job is being like, okay, I need to come up with someone who's like an ice skater in the nineties who does this. Yeah, and, yeah. and then you just look up a couple ice skaters, make up a fake name and then go to work at like trying to give the most, like the smallest amount of detail that makes it come to life. It's yeah. so much fun. Well, it's great because you end up like in your mind as the reader, or if you're me playing the game of like, which of these things is not like the other, and then you can't tell. <laughs> so you start buying that all of it's real. And what you end up doing is buying yourself a layer of authenticity in there through like the proximity to real historical figures, which is exactly. just so clever, like <laughs> so clever. I admire it so much. Um, okay. So I want to make sure that I get to audience questions soon and I have two more that I feel like I have to ask before I do, because I, I'm stubborn like that. Um, so I want to know what is the part of the story that compels you most to write it? Like, is it a single, is it a character? Is it the setting? Like, is it the context? Is it a game? Like, what is the thing that is the part you cannot put down even on the bad days? Yeah. You know what? I think it's, um, for each book, it's different, but it's, it's one particular thing that I want to say one particular type of woman that I want to uh, support or, or signal to people that lives inside me or is someone I have compassion for. So for Evelyn Hugo, it was very, very much about um, validating all types of love and, and again, untraditional family structures. Um, for, for Daisy Jones, it was really, um, wanting to write a story about, uh, unrequited love that mm -hmm. this, that, that this feeling of, um, not being chosen and, uh, and for Malibu rising, it was, it was Nina. It was wanting to give a voice one to, um, children that have sort of had to raise themselves and also for the older sisters that do the work that, that um their parents didn't do that who i think there are a lot of and i'm learning that there are even more than i thought with the release of this book which is in some ways um not a great thing but but in a lot of ways really touching to hear about it i think there are a lot of oldest sisters mm -hmm. who pick up a lot of slack in the world and i really wanted to tell a story about that woman and push her to a breaking point and yeah. see you know, if, 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 if Nina Riva is, is a pinata or, you know, like, let's, let's burst this thing open and see what comes spilling out. That was a big driver for me. Nina is one of my favorite female characters that I've read in recent memory. And I will say that Nina's reckoning was to me just like one of just the most satisfying reckonings I feel like of the series so far. And I say this as an only child. So it's not as if I have a lived experience that I'm echoing in this, but I just, I loved Nina. I thought, I thought you gave us enough of the history leading up to Nina for us to not become frustrated with what seemed like a person who was very willing to bend to everyone else's needs because we understood every brick that made that wall. Yeah. And yeah. then it was like, we understood exactly why she's the way she is, but we still want that wall to come down. And, and I think what is really, what meant a lot to me to present in this book is that there's the very literal story of she's an, she's an oldest um, sister and she's taking care of her siblings and her father has left and her mother has died. And, and there's a lot that's on Nina in a very literal way. Um, and, and, like, I, I think a lot of times, like, one of the, one of the questions that will be asked of people is like, like, who's your tribe? Like, you know, yeah. 
And to me, like Nina is my tribe and the people that, that in a literal sense feel a kinship with Nina, those are people that I feel a kinship with. Yeah. But I also think Nina can be a stand in for so many people who are the people who clean up the messes, who stick around and do the right thing and take care of other people when so many other people walk away. And, and so, I wanted Nina to stand for that too. Maybe you're not an oldest sister. Maybe your parents are around. Maybe it's a different way in which you've been the person who everyone around says, well, they'll take care of it. Yeah. And, and what if you, what if you put it down? Yeah. Which, which sounds, I mean, it's, it's so funny because I'm, I'm saying it. And yet as I'm saying it, it's also like, oh my God, what if I did? Like, I, like, <laughs> I'm, like I'm, it's something I'm working through as well, but, yeah, um, it, this book to me was about, and it's women, but I don't think it's only women that, that yeah. find themselves in this sort of situation. What if you put it down? Yeah. And and that was the driving force for me. I, I read a nonfiction book last year and something that I'll never forget from it. Um, it was called Burnout. And mm -hmm. something I'll never forget from it is that it was, it was said that men get to be human beings and women are human givings. And that like Ooh, women yeah. are very rarely given the space to sit in their own existence without contributing in some way. And I felt like Nina was the definition of somebody who believed that they only s existed as a human giving, not as a human yes. being. Yeah. Well, and I think if you do that long enough, you start to believe the message that your value is in what you do for others. Yeah. And so if you have a day where you don't do anything for other people, yeah. you have no value, yeah. which is debilitating. Yeah. And so that's why I have just don't rest. Yeah. <laughs> it's because it's like, well, then I will wait. If I'm not doing something for somebody else and I'm not taking care of somebody else, I'm not putting somebody else first. What am I? I think it can take a lot of forms too, right? So I'm single and I don't have a family, but I have a version of that with work where yeah. I feel like I am nothing if I am not contributing to my work. If I'm not making, if I'm not yes. creating, yes. then what good am I? Yes. And I feel, I like feel this all this the time. Yes. Mentality that is pervasive to anyone, not just, not just women, but especially to women who are exist in a sphere where it feels like our worth is contingent upon contribution. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay. I'm going to ask my last question and then I'm going to go to both the questions that have been sent in and some of the ones that are being asked now. And this is a very mean question. So I apologize. Okay. Um, okay. It's especially mean because we're doing an event for Malibu Rising and I'm going to ask you to look at all of your children for a second, uh, not your literal children. Yes. Your um, and so here's the thing. I asked this question on a series that I did called No Right Way. And it's brutal because I basically want to know if you could walk into a bookstore in a hundred years and only see one of your books still on the shelf, which would it be? Oh, wow. That's such a good one. Right. Boy. Well, let me say this. I hope that in a hundred years, even though it is a book that I feel, um, a very intense kinship with. I hope that the seven husbands of Evelyn Hugo seems very tame and unnecessary. Yeah. I I hope that we go into a world where um, you know a teenager looking for a book is not like oh she's she's not white and she's not straight and and it all feels very mundane. Um, I I hope that our world changes in that way. I, I wrote that book because it felt very necessary to to me to tell that particular story, uh, and I hope that the the messages no longer feel necessary. Um, so we'll go with Malibu Rising. <laughs> <laughs> very clever answer. Very clever answer. Um, all right. With that, I want to jump into some of these questions. I'm actually going to start with one of the questions that's been asked in the box here because I think it's because it kind of ties into something I was going to ask anyway. Okay. We've explored several decades, just several, you, you have like a true gift for time capsuling well, uh, an you. era. Um, are we going to see anything nearer to present day or do we do, is there a reason that you have stayed with what would now be called historical fiction, even though it's in the eighties, which is super depressing, but like, but is there, you know, what is it about the time? Is it the time periods that attract you or is it a story within the framework of the time periods? So we might see nineties and aughts and such. So it's both. It's, it's, I want to tell a story and I want to take you to a time and place. 
I want to do both of those things and I want them to feel so inextricably linked that it doesn't seem like two things are happening. This is a story that could only take place during this time and, and this particular location. Um, that's what feels escapist to me about the book. And the, and the more I can do that, I think the more I can get away with talking about themes that, that matter to me. Um, that being said, Yes, there is there is a method to this madness. And I I very much see Evelyn Hugo and Daisy Jones and Malibu Rising as the first three books of a quartet. Ooh. And so so 60s, 70s, 80s, and the next is 90s. Uh, and it will, I think, complete the set. Not not in any sense that you need this book in order to understand the others, but in the sense that these are ultimately going to be four books about particular types of women in the public eye. And there's one very specific type of woman, one very specific relationship between a woman and the public that I really want to dive into. And so that's okay. going to be the last piece of this. Are you actively, is this one actively in the world? Yeah, it's almost done. It's almost done. Yeah. And I, and I love it. And I mean, it's the kind of thing, like I, I would imagine that, that, you have this moment too, where like you're just hitting me during the time in which I'm feeling the the confidence. Oh, I was gonna say, it's a good day. It's yeah, a good day. Exactly. Bro. You're hitting me on a good day, and yeah. and then you know when it's about to come out, I'll be like, it's terrible, and I never should have written it. Everyone's gonna hate yeah, it, yeah. you know. But Great right now, coaster. yeah, <laughs> right now I'm on the top of the roller coaster, and um, I'm just very very excited about putting forth this as the final chapter. Amazing. Amazing. Well, you know, you have my email. My inbox is always <laughs> I'll send you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, that's so deeply exciting. I, I cannot wait. Um, and that kind of goes into another question here, which is so did sometimes we conceive of books and don't necessarily write them in the order that we get the ideas for them. Some ideas take longer than other ideas. But as far as the books in the quartet so far, did you have the ideas in that order that you wrote them? Has it just yeah. been Evelyn Daisy? Nina and then our new yeah I think really what happens for me and it's so funny because I think um this this is like I mean I've only had one kid but people that have multiple kids I think it happens like this where it's like I'm fully in this I'm you know I'm in the seven husbands of Evelyn Hugo I can't yeah. conceive of anything else I finish it and I'm like that was terrible it was so hard I'm never gonna do this again you know and then suddenly you're like oh, here's a new idea, you know? And it's like, you're only ready for that new one mm -hmm. until you fully settled all the feelings about, you know? And oh, so yeah. I'm, I'm always like, I can't, I don't know what comes next. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm done. I don't know. I don't have any good ideas. And then I finish the book yeah. and the next one comes. And so, and it was that way for Seven Husbands and it was that way for Daisy. And then it, it was that way I, I was turning in the final um, edits on Malibu Rising. And suddenly I was like, oh, I see it. I know exactly what it is. This is what I want to do. Yeah, I definitely, I don't have any children, but I will tell you that even the writing of books always feels like that, where I go through the same almost word for word, like <laughs> roller coaster of, of psychoses, <laughs> like to the point where my family's just like, we have done this exactly. Like they start doing voice recordings and like email screenshots. Cause they're like, we're just going to go around this circle yeah. every <laughs> single time. <laughs> every time. Just yeah. madness. Madness is repeating itself. Um, I want to ask a couple of process questions just because there are yeah. a lot of process. I'm sure there are a lot of writers watching. Um, rituals, process, anything that you want to talk about, basically, I'm going to like throw it out there to you because, you know, some days we want to talk about different things. But like what hey, there's no normal anymore. But like, what does it look like for you? What are the staples of it? Yeah, it's really about um, setting a goal and hitting it. And, and being sort of unwavering in that. Um, so, so I, for my first drafts, I don't know, like I know what the book is about and I know who the characters are more or less. And then um, I know how it ends, but that's it. So I start by researching uh -huh. I do that for like six weeks or so, maybe four weeks, it depends. And it's like watching movies, reading books, um, Wikipedia forever. Um, and then by that point, I've started to know enough about the world that I'm writing about that I understand certain things that might happen or I get an idea of, oh, I think this this should happen at some point. 
And I set a really strict goal of, I want the first draft done by this date. There's this many days, working days between now and then. So that means I have this many words per day. You have to do those words per day. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it's a really good system for me because it's not based on how good it is. It's just based on whether it's done. Uh, So my first drafts are complete trash. Like they're so bad. Um, But I just remove that pressure for any of it to be good. And then, and then I can get, and I think the hard, the first drafts are, are the hardest. And so once I'm through those, then the book gets easier. Um, But with COVID, one of the things, you know, especially having a kid and pulling her out of school, you don't, you can't hold yourself to that same timeline. And so what I've tried to do and carry through now that my kid's back in school is a little bit more of an ease about it that, Mm -hmm. you know, you don't have to to punish yourself for it, set reasonable goals that are achievable. Don't set the craziest goal and then see if you can match it. You know, it's like, take it down a notch. And, and so far that's going okay. Anything to diminish the self-loathing and self-doubt on a daily basis. Like we should, we writers are so good at punishing ourselves. I actually ended up having to switch from word count goal to time goal Mm -hmm. because if it was a word count goal, I would just I would punish myself no matter what happened. Yeah. I would either like hit the word count and then force myself to keep going to the point where I then hated it and yeah. everything I had down on paper, or I wouldn't hit yeah. it and I would hate myself. Well, also the thing with the word goal that's so funny is that afterward I will go back and read it and I will see how much I was just extending yep. things to get to <laughs> it'll, I, it'll be like, she was wearing a blue dress. It was blue. The blue is like, like blue. get that word. Yeah. <laughs> what? Like I could have saved us so much time, you know, like don't do that. But, yeah. but I will look and it's, and I will see whole paragraphs where it's like, I just wanted a hundred more words for the day. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe I should switch to an hour, but, but the thing is, I'll just stare at a screen for a few hours. And see, here's like, my mm-hmm. argument though. So my yeah. whole argument of this is this is where I'm like, be kinder to yourself, is that time spent staring at a screen is also writing. Yes. And that time spent going for a walk is also writing. That time spent thinking is also writing. Yes. And so, but I understand your point. I I switched specifically because I got tired of finding those extra 500 words where I was like, was I just (laughs) trying to get that? Like, what did I, what am I doing here? So my question is, do you find yourself, because you have this first draft process that is both in some ways skeletal because it's trying to get something onto paper and also exploratory because you don't know every detail. Yeah. Do you find that the, the first revision then that second draft is where a lot of the monumental stuff takes shape? It's the first draft is really where I realize what I'm writing about. And so the second draft is the, really the first draft that I'm doing with a point of view. It's, it's the first one that's like, here's the goal. I'm going from here to here by way of here. And, um, you know, so that's where the the most huge changes take place from the first to the second draft. Like in the, in the book that I am just finishing up the, the difference between, like, I remember I ended the first draft of, of this new one. And I don't know if you have this feeling, but like in general, I feel like if I get to the very end and I know exactly like the last sentence, it, it points to like, okay, I know what I'm doing. I got to the end of this. I got to the end and I was like, okay, the end. Like I didn't have anything. Yeah. I think, I think like the last line was something like, and you know what? I'm fine. Or like something <laughs> so like, useless, like so yeah. useless. And I said to my husband, I'm like, that's not a good sign. Um, yeah. And so that's when I knew the whole second draft had to have such a stronger sense of purpose Mm -hmm. so that I knew where it was going in a really powerful way. And and so once I did that, then the book took shape. I mean, that's the thing about endings, right? Is this the one of the few things I have to know before I start writing and it's the thing that I write toward. And then when you hit it, then it determines the revision for the whole rest of the book. Because now you're like, okay, that's my landing. So now this is what I'm working toward as I work back toward it again. Yeah, that's exactly it. Oh my goodness. Oh, I also just get so as a, as an outliner, I'm just like very stressed <laughs> out with the cons. I just, I get into this with, I mean, this is the reason behind that whole no right way series is the idea that there's no right yeah. way. Right. Um, but who, uh, which of your books has taken the longest 
to get onto the paper in that way, not just in the first draft, but in like from yeah. idea to execution. This one, Malibu Rising took the longest. I think it's it's been the most ambitious in terms of how many characters there are, mm-hmm. how much happens and and how much I wanted to say. And it's also the first time that I've written in the third person. I normally do first person or or, you know, no narrator. Yeah. Um, and so this was new for me. And I really, there's a lot of this book that was just rewritten. I, I, my editor really worked with me to get this into the shape that it's in because I had a lot of like really experimental, crazy things that I wanted to do at first and only some of them worked and some of them didn't. And so I really threw my heart into this one in a, mm-hmm. in a brand new way. Well, structurally it works for you. I mean, to have the spinal column of the book be this party yeah. and then be able to basically set it over one night and all of the years preceding that night. It, it's yeah. nice. I think anytime you can have a built-in structural complexity like that, that has this kind of propulsive force, because you know that by the end of the night, everything's going to yeah, You know where it's going. Read, yeah. You read with that bated breath of like, every time somebody got into a car, every time somebody left, I was like, <laughs> yeah. oh God, are they going to die? Is this going to happen? Is someone going to fall in the pool and drown? Like, oh no, yeah. why are they doing drugs in the pool? They're going to drown. Like every yeah, time do that. Happened, yeah. I was waiting for the, the literal spark and the metaphorical spark that was going to kick off the blaze that's promised in the very first page of the book. And so, yeah. I, I mean, like I say, I wrote, I read the entire book today. Like I could not stop because I was like, well, I need to know. And you become such a spectator as well as a speculator when that happens. Ooh, very well put. I've not heard that before. That's good. Um, Writers. Okay. I want to know, are there any other Easter eggs besides McReva that people? Oh yeah. 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 If, I mean, if people read um, at the very beginning, there's a few popped in there, but then if you read between the lines, there there are references to uh, there's de- I mean she's not said by name, but you you see Mick Mary Evelyn for mm-hmm. a moment, and uh, there are some people at the party that that you've seen before, uh, which is which is like again we're talking about like super fun parts of writing this book, like being able to sprinkle those in and play with you know who I created over here and then putting them there and putting them in a new context is always really fun. Kit in particular has a very brief uh, Violet North, who was like a one line in Evelyn Hugo as Rex North's daughter, eventually. Okay. Now she's old enough that she, like she's partying with Kit. It's like fun stuff like that. Oh, I love it. I mean, it's also a lot of like time play, right? Like a yes. lot of counting forward as to who would be the right age and who would have children and who's yes. in it. like, I yeah. mean, I just think that's, that's, that's some of the fun that some of like, you can see the writer smiling like when. Yeah. Well, and the thing that always kind of like blows my mind, even though I created it and I did it is that Evelyn Hugo for a very brief moment in time is Nina Riva's stepmother. Yeah. Which like it's for a day, <laughs> but, and they never meet, but that to me uh, just for some reason cracks me up because <laughs> they couldn't, they couldn't be more different. These two women. But it's also so Hollywood. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Generational situation. Like, like one of my favorite ones was that there was a period of time where Nicole Kidman was engaged to Lenny Kravitz. Yeah. So there was a moment where Nicole Kidman was going to be Zoe Kravitz's stepmother, mm-hmm. and it's like, and then they're in Big Little Lies together, yeah. and they're friends now, and it's just right there's something here. about it that I find so charming. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll never forget the, oh, I don't think I can say it on camera. It's fine. I, but I was going to say, those things are so small. I had an actress who auditioned and it would have been like auditioning with her ex-boyfriend to be her brother. And it was everything. You're just like, everything yes. is so small. Yes. Um, okay, here's a question I love from Mariana. How do you know that you have to write a story? Like, how do you ha- get to the point where you look at an idea and say like, that's like, I need to write that or that's more than the pieces like, do you, what, what gives you like, what, how do you get past the insecurity and the questions and know that that's worth holding on to? Yeah. I mean, I think I have like four different answers to this and they're all contradictory. Um, on the one hand, I would say like, maybe you don't ever have that feeling. Like, I think the thing for me is, do I want to like, do I want to? Yes, I do. And I think that's enough. Like, do you have to? Is the world going to stop if you don't? 
No, the world would not stop if I hadn't written a single book. The, you know, like the world, I it means a lot to me that people that my that people have connected with my work, but but I don't think I'm necessary to the foundation of the turning of the universe, you know. But I love it. I love it. And I get excited by it. So so with Malibu Rising, it's like, oh yes, I I'm inspired and excited about the idea of spending time in Malibu in my mind. I'm excited about the idea of putting forth Nina Riva as a person that excites me. And I think it's excitement is enough because you need something to fully fuel you through when it sucks. Yeah. Um, but then, but then the other thing that I was going to say is that it, it does feel a little bit guttural. Like mm -hmm. it's, I can't explain it, but I've had a bunch of different ideas that I don't follow through on. So why is this one that I did? And I think it's something that you feel in your gut. And I think part of that is, and this is something that I talk about with my friend, Ashley, who is um, really coming into her own as a writer now is you can have 10 ideas and there might actually be one that is better than the one you want to write. But in general, I think, the ones for me are, can I see it? Do I see it unfolding? Is the work of figuring out what happens already starting to happen because I can see it? Um, and like I said, you can't put all those answers into one cohesive answer because I actually don't know that they even are in agreement with each other, but that's, that's my Weird nonsense. But I love that because I give a similar answer when people ask about publishing specifically because I feel like writing and publishing are different things, obviously. Yeah. And yeah. I feel like I, the answer I always give is like, you have to want it more than you're afraid of failing to get it. Yeah. And like this sense yeah. that like fear and rejection or self-doubt or insecurity, these things are there all the time. Like we don't suddenly stop feeling them. It's just right. that that conviction, that desire to do the thing that, yeah. you know, something has sunk its teeth into us and like the desire outweighs the fear, outweighs the insecurity, but it doesn't eliminate it. No, no. And, and also I think you're saying exactly the thing where, you know, it's like sometimes the only thing stronger than fear is desire. And sometimes the only thing stronger than desire is fear. Exactly. And, and it's, it dictates the course of our lives where, where we find that balance. And I think, um, there's a lot to be afraid of, in my opinion, of publishing. There's a lot of things that are difficult about it. Um, I would, I would tell anyone that's starting to write to to tamp down, like release any of your fears about writing. Nobody ever has to see it. Yeah. The only person who's going to know whether you think it's good or not is you. That's it. You, that's the only place you have to start and being afraid of that answer, being afraid of, am I the writer that I want to be? Um, no one is, Yeah. you know, like I'm not the writer that I want to be. So um, if you yeah. can make, if you can make some peace with that fear as a writer, nothing can stop you. True. True. All right. As we wind down, I want to end on kind of a fun direction. So your, uh, this is such a full circle system for you because your works then have been optioned. Yeah. And so like, you're now taking the fictional Hollywood and reintegrating it with the real yes. Hollywood. Yes. So first of all, how surreal is that? Very surreal. And also, um, like just more creatively satisfying than I ever envisioned. Like, I'm going to make a fake band and then they're going to be a real band. It's weird. It's like having a 3d printer in your brain. Where it's <laughs> like, like, Oh, I made up somebody named Daisy Jones. And now Daisy Jones is standing in front of me. It's like, how did that go from here to, to three dimensions? Uh, it's very cool. So which character that you have written, mm -hmm. are you most excited to see then manifested like in yeah. the, in the, the live action fictional weirdness that is yeah that sphere you know it there are so many and it's and it's like a little bit i think a sign and an embarrassing sign of like just how in love i am with my own characters because they do seem real to me and like i do like root for them even though consciously i know that it's not real um I really want to see McRiva. 
Mm-hmm. I want to, I want to see it. And you know, the other thing too, is like, I want to be a little bit tortured by how much I hate him, but the actor is so good. I can't hate him. I want to feel that. Like I, I, I have so many feelings about it. Mm-hmm. Um, I really want to see Evelyn Hugo. I think that there are, um, some actresses in particular who would be really, really stunning. And I want to see it happen. Um, I want to see Nina. And, and, you know, with Daisy Jones, I've been really blessed because the, the cast is so good. It's so good. And the scripts are so good that I find myself, you know, I'm reading the scripts and I'm going, oh my gosh, like Cami Marone is going to be amazing in this scene. Yeah. Or, you know, Riley Keough is going to be phenomenal or Sam Claflin. It's like, it, it's just, it's a project that I, I think, um, I, I know this is bold. I know it. And I feel like I can say this because I'm not at all involved in it. I think that it'll be as good as the book. I really do. Wow. And so I'm, I mean, if you thought the book was good, it presupposes that. <laughs> idea. Um, I think they're going to do a phenomenal job. So I'm I mean, just, that's the greatest that. gift, right? Is like when yeah. um, a, another version of your creation can stand on its own. Yes. And be, because I think people always get like the book community gets very strange in this way, right? They get very like, oh, the book was better. Or the film was better. And it's like, but they one doesn't erase the other. Like, oh, I hope the no. show or the movie's good as if if it's not or if it's in some way not what you want. It doesn't it doesn't affect the book. The book is the book. Right. Like, well, and, and you've experienced it as a book, right? Yeah. So so for me in an adaptation, what I want and what I think they're doing really well with Daisy Jones is um it's going to be different. Things are going to happen differently. The characters are slightly different. Everything's a little bit different in a way that feels fresh and exciting, but the feeling is the same. And so that's where I get really excited because I think about my favorite adaptations of late, like normal people, or I really, really loved high fidelity um, with Zoe Kravitz. And it's like, that's a perfect example, totally different story. I mean, the main character is a totally different mm-hmm. person, but the feeling yeah, it's is the heart and soul. Yeah. You can capture the heart and soul and the details can change and it's not going to change the fact that it's still the story. Yeah, exactly. I cannot wait. I am so excited. Also, so excited for your next book. I feel very greedy having just finished your new one. <laughs> that's the thing is these books take years to write and they can take hours to read. I and know. So- <laughs> but um. Taylor, it has been an absolute joy talking with you. Well, thank you for doing this. I feel like I could talk to you for hours and I love that that we both get to talk to each other about our books. It makes this me This is a happy. full circle moment. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Yeah. And what, one day we will be in the same country at the same time. I know, time. right? And one God day, knows what could happen. It's going to work out. It's going to work out. I'll just be knocking on your door being like, hello, that book, please. I, <laughs> <laughs> I will. My door will be open wide. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Taylor. And thank you, Barnes and Noble for yes, hosting thank this. You. If you haven't already got your copy, please go get your copy of Malibu Rising. It is absolutely delightful. And there's extra content in the Barnes and Noble edition. I did a whole map, which I worked very hard on. Um, and I think it's it's very, very cool. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone.